The plant was named Omsk Transmash. It has produced the legendary T-34, T-55, and T-80. Now it supplies military engineering transport and bridge laying machines. They also repair and upgrade combat vehicles here. The product range seems to be unlimited. The factory is huge. It occupies nearly two and a half million square meters. This is a real military industry giant. This is the first overhaul stage. Here we dismantle tanks. First, the vehicles are washed and checked for gun shells and other explosives left inside. We take off the turrets uh, from the gear parts, then we work on them separately. Some parts are disposed and some recycled. We change them for new ones. Other modules are subjected to an upgrade. They start with dismantling the machine and washing all the parts. Almost 20,000 pieces need to be taken off and numbered. Some of them have to be disposed of. The others need some repair. Siberian plant workers will make the tank 30 years younger. They start with the installation of explosive reactive armor. Anatoly, I can smell welding. What are they doing here? Alexei, we are at the welding assembly line. Here we work on a new tank shell for the T-72B3. Here, the explosive reactive armor is being installed. Vyacheslav can explain it a lot better. Vyacheslav, hello. So there is the shell of a T-72 tank, and it is ready for upgrades, right? Yes. This is the ERA, which stands for Explosive Reactive Armor. If the shell is under gunfire of bullets or even 30 millimeter shells, it doesn't explode. It's designed to withstand a hit of anti-tank weapons. As a result, a T-72 B3 survives the hit of armor-piercing projectiles twice as better as the old model. And it's 50% more effective when it comes to a hardcore shell hit. I hope welders won't get jealous. <laughs> I think they won't. Plates and fins of the ERA are made of strong metal so the armor gets stronger even without the explosive element. It makes the vehicle one ton heavier. After the shell plates are welded together and all the armor elements are installed, what is going to happen next? The shell is going to take a bath as we call it. This is how we check it for probable leaks. Okay, so it's better to give the welding machine to someone who could use it more effectively. I hope you will fix everything I've done and I will have a look at the shell taking a bath. A crane takes a shell into a basin filled with anti-rust compound. It is left there for 20 minutes while the staff is performing a leak test. If necessary, they will fix the leaks manually and repeat the procedure. Cool, so it's as simple as that, right? Okay, I got it. Now, as they took the shell to the reservoir, it's time to sink it into the compound. Two and a half meters below the surface. It's fretting a bit, but now I have to go inside and check the hull for leakage. If the joints turn out loose, they have to be re-welded. Even though I hammered it hard enough, I didn't find anything. The shell will be thoroughly examined one more time. Then they install new torsion bars, gearboxes, and tracks. And now let's have a look at the most important mechanical part of the tank. It's a brand new powerful engine. So this is the new engine for the T-72B3. What was wrong with the old one? Why is this thing better than its predecessor? Well, this engine has a new design. It's called the V84 and it was designed especially for the T-72B3. First, it allows the vehicle to go faster. Second, a more powerful engine can carry uh, a bigger weight. It means we are able to install more protection and equipment. Throughout all its history, the T-72 has changed the number of V-type engines. The first one was called the V2. They installed the same power package to the legendary T34. This V84 is turbocharged. It provides 840 brake horsepower. 
Usually, the more powerful engine we have, the more heat it produces. It makes the tank more visible in thermal viewers. Is it a problem? The designers thought about it. Such a big engine will enlarge the tank's heat signature. They have managed to solve this problem with the use of um, uh, aluminum gill finned radiators. The engine is delivered to the factory without any auxiliary equipment. It is installed here. They set up an exhaust smoke system, injectors, and clutches. Then the cooling system and oil inputs are connected. The engine is ready to be set in the tank, but it still needs some adjustments. So we've installed all the chassis components and have performed a proper field test. It meets all the requirements. It's just gorgeous. What about the gun? Are there any changes? Yes, there are. The T-72B3 is equipped with a high-precision gun, 2A 46M5. It provides better strike accuracy up to 30% due to some design changes. The gun has a, a longer slide and a more sophisticated recoil mechanism. The new gun can fire new ammunition. For example, it's equipped with Finet's composite shells. The barrel no longer has wall variations, so it's not affected by flexures. What is more, the gun tube is covered with thermal control coating. It doesn't allow the weather conditions to affect the strike accuracy. As far as I understand, this is some kind of test rig. Yeah, here we conduct one of the final testings before the gun is installed into the turret. We imitate a shot to measure the back load. The breech of the gun is pulled with a cord. Then the back blow distance is measured. If it's okay, the spent case injection system is tested. After that, the gun is ready to be installed into the turret. As soon as the spuds are fit into the pits of the gun, then it's fixed with screws and wires. The turret is equipped with the fire sight and control system. This T-72B3 is almost ready to fight. There's only one little thing left. The tour has to be fixed to the chassis. Its weight is 15 tons, so we need a crane and the help of a specialist. How many people do you need to install it? This procedure is performed by three workers. The turret is aligned by the center line. Torah and base rings are getting connected. There are bearings along the sides of the base ring. The workers have to use leveling devices to put everything in its right place. If they make a mistake, shift the parts a millimeter aside, the bearings would break and the turret would be locked. So you have to be precise while doing this. If the turret is blocked, the crew won't be able to fire the gun. They even won't have the possibility to load it if it doesn't move. They won't be able to do their job properly. You can't shoot when the turret is locked. What makes it turn? Do you? install bearings before you put the turret on the uh, chassis or maybe they are already there in the rings they are already inside it we place them there at the earlier production stages now you see the ring and it already has small steel balls inside they are put into lubricant springs are then used to help them spread along the ring and uh sorry to interrupt I, I think it's done at least one guide is there yes the first one is there now they are working with the second guide and then both guiding screws are taken out it's time to bolt the torque to the base ring the chassis is down i i see how heavy it is yeah it's heavy i mean this torque is a heavy thing after all 15 tons is a big number and now it's done so the torque is in its place now it has to be attached to the chassis am i right Yes, the turret is bolted on with 46 big screws. The screws go circle-wise, right? Yes, they do. And then internal wiring. First we install the loader, then we install the wiring, and after that we adjust the fire control system. And you have six hours for that? Yes. Well, good luck then. It reminds me of a circus show when they load the tank to a flat car. I can even imagine the poster. It would say, Flying Elephants. During the loading, the turret is turned backwards for better weight distribution. Front armor is always heavier. There are railway tracks at the plant. 
They are used to ship newborn tanks to the troops. They will start their new lives at new places.